Good. Okay, so as we're getting set up, let me just give an introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to see everyone in person after a long time of being away. I know this is a cliche, but it really is the energy that we get from this is, is fantastic. Um, thanks for those of you who have been with us for the past couple of days, and uh, I'm just going to plug, plug in. Um, we've got blood drawing set up today, so for those of you, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about later why we're doing it, but it is really important for those of you who'd like to, to be part of the blood drawing portion of this, and we've got the team here all day for this. So I'm going to share back today, uh, you're going to come and see me a couple times today, I'm going to share back today information that we've gotten from both the online portion of the natural history study as well as the koala study. Um, so you're not going to see anyone's name here, so everything is de-identified, but you may see your information there if you look closely, um, it'll be in there. Uh, all of this information available online afterwards, so if you're viewing from home, if you're sitting here but you don't want to take furious notes, don't worry, it's all going to be posted, and if you have any questions, I'm around all day and you can ask me questions about this. I am also, with permission from the Rosen family, going to talk a little bit about what we've seen in terms of the what we call N of one study, uh, the N of one in terms of treatment. Then I'll give you the punchline in this is that I do feel like there's a path forward in terms of treatment. It's not perfect. It's not yet something that we've got everything figured out, but part of what we're here today is to understand how we can move forward as a community. And so we need to have lots of input in terms of thinking through this. And I'll explain how we can make sure that no one's left behind as we're going through with this, because that's very important to me is that we're inclusive and we come up with solutions for everyone, but that's not going to happen immediately. So we've got to think about how we, we can do this together. Okay, so as we're going forward, uh, this is meant to be very informal. I will say for those questions that come in online, I'm going to hope the AV team can help me in terms of shouting out those questions. Uh, but if there's anyone in the room that has questions, just stop me. Just hold up your hand, and I don't want, if you've got the question, someone else in the room or online has the same question, so just stop me, because sometimes I can get really excited and go too fast, and, and sometimes you guys need to tell me to slow down. Okay, so... Um, so as we're going through this, and some of these slides you'll see before, because um, we've used them in other ways, uh, I'm not going to go through everything in terms of, you know, how we go from molecules to treatments. You're going to hear that over the course of a couple days, but to say that we've had a team of people working very hard behind the scenes and around the world, and we've been working on this together. Um, again, you don't know it, but we have uh, basically lab meetings. Uh, and many people at KIF1A.org who have been instrumental in terms of pushing this forward. And so hopefully you'll see the fruits of this over the next couple of days. Um, for those of you who are new to the community, and I know there are some people who have gotten their diagnosis as recently in the last month, I'm going to go a little bit more slowly over this so that everyone can come up to the same level. For some of you that are old timers, it'll be review, um, but just to say there hasn't been anything radically different in what we've said before. Uh, we do now have a little more information about longitudinally what's changing over time. And that's probably for the old timers, the most important thing is that it's critically important because this does change over time for us to know how it changes and to know how fast it changes and to know for different people how that change may differ. That's gonna be, end up being really, really important to be able to make predictions and then to be able to know that how that's different if we have an intervention. So predominantly, we continue to see the same features, and I'm going to go through these one by one, and I apologize, it's very data dense, but if you listen to me, I'm going to tell you the take-home message. So if you want to even just shut your eyes and not look at the data, you don't have to, but for those of you who are really interested in the data, being completely transparent and putting everything out there. This still continues to be primarily a neurological condition, so primarily a brain and nerve condition. As we see this, there are nerves in different parts of the body, including the eye and the optic nerve, and so you're going to hear about that this afternoon. The brain and seizures and thinking and behavior, that's primary in terms of this, and then also the nerves that go throughout the body, so that go to the arms and the legs and lead to some of the problems we see with spasticity and some of the pain, the neuropathies. Those continue to be the primary things that we see. We do see some other manifestations though, because there are nerves that go to the intestine, to the tummy. And so we do see manifestations with that that are also a result of the nerves that we see. And probably also some other features in the eyes that again, you'll hear about cataracts we're seeing in some of the older individuals, not so much the younger individuals, and then some problems with growth as well. 
None of those other problems are devastating. Still, the main focus that we have is on the brain. And I'm saying that in terms of the brain, because as we're thinking about where we need to deliver a treatment, we primarily need to do it up here in the head. Okay, so that's where you're going to hear us focusing as we go through. Just very, very briefly, so you understand what some of the scientists are talking about later. This is the uh, KIF-1A is part of a family of genes called kinesins. They're motors. They're like trains going on a railroad track, as we've talked about before. And within this, there are two of the motors that come together like this, two copies of the gene of the protein that come together like this. Two is important to know because when it's two, if there's a problem with either one of those, they poison each other. And so with that, this is what we call a dominant negative. Dominant because if with the two copies of the gene, one has a problem, it dominates the other one. It poisons the other one as they come together. So as you're gonna hear us talking about the strategy, what we need to do is get rid of that dominant one that's dominating the other one. We need to get it out of the way. We need to clear it out of the system. And so that's what you're gonna hear us talking about in terms of going forward. This train that's going down the tracks has cargo that it's carrying, and it's carrying around the nerve cells, and the nerve cells can be very, very long. They can go all the way through the body down to the tip of your toe, and so some of those really, really long nerve cells have a long way for those trains to go to carry that cargo, and so some of the cells that we see most affected, some of the parts of the body that see we are most affected are some of those longest neurons, the ones that have the farthest to go in terms of doing that. Okay, I'm gonna to get to some of the other points that are here later. One of the things, and, and everyone has a role to play in this because we're so different and that's wonderful, but it's also challenging. Most of the people in this room and online are individuals that have of the two copies have just one of the two copies of the gene with the problem. There are very few people out there, but there are some that we know that have what we call a recessive form of the gene where both of the copies have a problem. And I'm gonna leave those folks aside for right now because it's a very small part of our community, thankfully, but it's probably gonna take a slightly different form of treatment as we go forward. For most individuals where we know it, we find that these variants are new in the child with the problem or in the person with the problem. And we use the term de novo, or arising new. And I say this because for some of you, you'll ask yourself the question, do we have to worry about any siblings for us if we have other children? Talk to me offline if you're interested in that. But if you know that it's de novo in your family, then really the only person that needs to be concerned about is the person with CAN themselves. The other members of the family, in general, it's not a concern. But if anyone has questions, come and ask me. One of the things that we have as a challenge for this, let me just go right here is that we have a lot of differences in terms of what those actual genetic variants are. And again, anyone who is interested in this, in particular, any of the scientists, we're glad to, to provide this. This is a stick figure of the protein itself. And I'm sorry, I don't have a great pointer here online. This is going from one end of the, of the gene to the other end, oops, sorry here. And then we've blown up this motor domain here into a very big region here. Each one of those dots is one of you all in terms of each dot represents a person. And where we see this tower, that's one individual position within the protein with multiple people who have the same exact genetic variant. So the reason I'm showing you is that you see that there are some places where we have tall towers, certain positions where we have multiple people that independently by chance alone, you're not related to each other. It's not like you all have a single common great, great, great grandmother. Independently, we're seeing this particular change. But for many of these, you'll see that you're an island. You may be the only person or your child may be the only person in the world so far that we know of with that particular genetic variant. That leads to some challenges because one of the questions you all often ask me is, what can I expect in the future? What should I predict? What should I expect? What do we need to do? And sometimes I just have no data. You are the only person that we know of so far in terms of that. So I can try and make guesses based on what we've seen so far, but I wanna be clear they're guesses based on what we know. 
For some of you, in a good way, we do know something else. As the numbers have been increasing, and in a good way, the numbers are increasing, we're banding this information together to learn from each other. And in some cases, we're finding individuals in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and I'm sure there are older out there who have this condition. One of the things that would be great is to find more older people with these conditions so that we can know what to expect and we can know what we need to do to prevent those problems from happening in the future. But as you're gonna see, most of our community is skewed towards a younger age. Again, not because they're not out there, but because they haven't been diagnosed with these genetic methods yet. Okay. So in doing this, I'm gonna go briefly, as I said, through both the information that we have from the online study, as well as what we've been doing for those of you who have come to New York for the koala study. Um, and I'd say in general, we're seeing the same thing. So there's not anything radically different. I think the two groups are representing each other. The nice thing about the in-person koala study though, is as we're planning for clinical trials, we needed to have very granular data to know what folks could actually do. So that as we think about the measures we're gonna to use to test the impact of a treatment, we can see what's going to be in the dynamic range, what we can see movement on, what we can see change on. So by the numbers, I want you to give a sense of where we are now, right now in the community. So the numbers are good. I will tell you, for those of you who are either in the room or out, out at home and haven't been part of this, I'm not trying to twist your arm. No one has to do anything, but I do think it's in the community's best interest to be able to participate, at least in terms of registering so we know you're out there, we know what your genetic variant is, we know where you are in the world, because without that information, and as I'll get to, without the blood samples, there is a chance that you're going to be left behind, and I don't want to leave anyone behind as we're doing this. So, so as we do this, I know our numbers are greater than 177, and that's why I said I don't want to leave anyone behind. Um, through this, we've been going through multiple time points, and I know these things take time, I know they take energy, but as I said, find a you know, time after the kids are in bed and be able to sit down and do this or tell us how we can make it easier for you. As you can see, as we go through the time, the numbers are lower. That's in part because some people just have been, they've had a diagnosis for a shorter period of time. Uh, some people though, as I said, from the missing numbers, you can see that people have been dropping off. And so we wanna, for those of you who may have gotten lost, you're not sure if you've done all of your studies, all of your surveys, uh, talk to Sean and the others in the back room with the blood drawing, we'll make sure you get back on track. Um, as we're doing this, this is what I was saying in terms of the distribution by ages. Most of our folks are, are basically less than the age of 10 at this point. We have some folks who are teenagers. We have even fewer folks that are adults. Uh, but again, it's based mostly in terms of how, when people are uh, getting ask, access to genetic testing. Um, for anyone who's interested, I'll just tell you, I'm trying to solve the genetic testing problem for everyone. So I've got that one covered. Uh, we'll get there for that. But in the meantime, um, that's what we have. Again, in terms of thinking about this, this gets diagnosed as many things. And I tell you, in case you happen to be part of uh, parent groups or other things in the community, it gets diagnosed as cerebral palsy, can gets diagnosed as epilepsy, it gets diagnosed as developmental uh, disabilities, uh, intellectual disabilities. Um, it gets called many things, but at the end of the day, it is gonna matter in terms of getting a specific molecular diagnosis, as you're gonna see in terms of the treatments that we have going forward. But it gets called all of these things, and by frequency, everyone's got something in terms of these symptoms, um, mainly in terms of, as I said, problems in terms of thinking, speaking, development, uh, and then epilepsy. There are some issues with movement and the issues you all know very well. These are the fancy terms that we use for it. And Dr. Bain's going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, and then epilepsy is something that Dr. Sands is going to talk about this afternoon. So I'm not trying to hold anything back from you, but just to let you know, I'm going to give you a very broad overview and then other people are going to go deep into the data. Um, with this, there are many types of seizures that we see. Dr. Sands and Dr. Bain and I have been thinking a lot about this, both in terms of looking at the actual EEG data that we've been collecting from you and collecting as part of the koala study, and then also being able to look at what we're seeing within your uh, individuals, within your families. And I'll say it's complicated. I think we're seeing many things that um, are probably not seizures, overt seizures, but we are seeing things on the EEG that in a good way are going to be helpful for us in terms of understanding whether or not a treatment is 
is having effect on the brain, even besides seizures. So in a good way, EEGs are going to be really important. And thanks for all of you that uh, were working with us yesterday and the day before in terms of getting that information. Um, with this, people have been using a lot of different types of medications for the seizures, and I'll say that unfortunately there's not one sort of silver bullet that takes care of the seizures. In certain cases, people have had to be on even multiple seizures. I'm sure many of you have had those experiences, and unfortunately the medications themselves cause other problems, and so there's no great sort of magic bullet in terms of the seizures. Uh, I do think at the end of the day we're going to have to just primarily treat the disorder to be able to take care of the seizures. Um, completely adequately. The thing that I know scares us all is that we know that this is degenerative. We know that over time we lose cells and we can see this by looking at the brain. And so many of you have been kind enough to provide us with the actual MRIs. We have a neuroradiologist who's been looking at this, looking at the different parts of the brain where we see more loss, greater loss. We've been using all of that to think about when we deliver something to the brain, what portions of the brain are we gonna make sure that we don't miss? And this ends up, I know it sounds a, a little odd, um, but based on the way we're literally going to deliver a drug to the brain, whether we do it through the back, whether we do it through uh, what we call the ventricles, we need this information to think about the distribution and where things are going to go. So for those of you who haven't, uh, if you have had MRIs, and in particular, if you've seen MRIs over time, I'm not telling you to go get an MRI just for the sake of it, just for the fun of it. But if you do have those MRIs, we're using that data, as I said, to try and think about literally how we deliver where we deliver, how diffuse we need to get this around. Um, so this is proving to be really important. Um, this is one of the first things, and I know it's a little bit confusing, so let me try and uh, tell you what we've done here. We've tried to look at the information over time. So this is the first time we're really showing you as much data as we have longitudinally. So looking at the same person over time, and again, we've been able to see people with multiple time points and trying to see what seems to be getting better, what seems to be getting worse, what seems to be changing most. And what I'll take from this, and I know the colors may be hard for some people to see, the seizures, not surprisingly, are something that we've seen a little wobbliness uh, but in general, and perhaps not surprisingly, there are some people that don't have seizures at a younger age, but can develop seizures at an older age. So the point in terms of thinking about this is if your child hasn't had seizures yet, in some cases, they're never going to have seizures because we certainly have adults who have never, ever, ever had seizures. But it is something in terms of your neurologist or whoever your doctors are at home being able to continue monitoring. And if you see something, say something, right? So if you see something that you're worried about it, if you can, grab your phone, take a video, share it with your doctor, uh, because just because there hasn't been a seizure before doesn't mean there can't be a seizure in the future. And again, there are medications already that we have that can treat this. Um, Ali is going to go over a lot more in terms of the vision, uh, but I do worry from a safety point of view that sometimes our young people are having some difficulty with vision, and we may not realize it. They may not even realize it because it just is what it is. The world looks different to them, um, and, and they don't even know to say something. Um, we can see this, though, especially when we're looking in the eyes. And one of the things that Koala, I think, has been the most useful for is that many individuals didn't even realize when they came to see us that there were already eye changes or optic nerve atrophy. And it wasn't until we started looking very, very carefully using ways to look in the eyes and see some of these early changes that we saw those changes. So one of the messages I have for you is that even if you haven't, if you've said, um, I think the eyes are fine, we haven't seen any. Thing, I do think it's now good to go back to your eye doctor locally, have them look specifically for the optic nerve atrophy, and they may have to do some very specific things to do that. Um, but I'd say this has been way, way underdiagnosed in our community. And again, from a safety point of view, I think it's important to be able to know what the vision is, and we'll get into broken bones and other things. Uh, but when you're trying to navigate with other things that make it harder, the last thing you want to do is then be able to have safety issues. So with this, um, we see things, like I said, the optic nerve atrophy, I think, is our biggest change in terms of what we've been seeing, but we continue to see many of the things you always have been seeing. 
need for glasses, uh, lazy eyes, in some cases, surgery for that. So I don't think anything's changed in terms of that story, uh, but the optic nerve atrophy continues to be progressive. And again, I talked about it before in terms of where we need to get treatment. One thing that we're trying to think about is getting treatment to the eyes is a little bit different than getting treatment to the brain. And so at some point, we're going to have to think about how to be able to do both of those. So stay tuned for that. But, but we've realized that, and that's been an important learning that we've had. Um, this is what we've seen, and again, we're going to go over it this afternoon, um, and if you want to take a picture of this or take this to your eye doctor, um, but there's some very specific ways that uh, Ali is going to go over this afternoon in terms of what they can do to quantify and to look very carefully for these changes in the eyes, and they're not something that your optometrist is doing. So if you're going to someone who's just fitting you for glasses, being able to make sure it's the right prescription, they're not equipped to be able to look for these changes. Um, so uh, when we're talking with her this afternoon, I want to make sure you've got a good sense of, of what's involved. Um, with this, and this is showing again over age and showing longitudinally, the main thing that I want to highlight is that light blue line that's at the top is that optic nerve atrophy we're continuing to see to be progressive. And so not surprisingly, based on what we know about other things that we're seeing, we're losing some of those cells in the nerve in the back of the eye. And so with that, individuals can still see. They're not blind, but it becomes an issue of it getting increasingly limited in terms of what they're seeing. Distinguishing colors gets to be a little bit more difficult. And so some of what they're seeing, they're literally seeing the world in a different way. And so uh, we're going to learn more about that this afternoon. Um, again, this story hasn't changed, but in terms of some of the gastrointestinal issues, we're still continuing to see those fluctuation between constipation, diarrhea. Again, part of this is the nerve cells coming in, uh, but I just want you to realize it's not in your imagination. Uh, these are real things. Um, there's no magic bullet either for this, largely in combination of some of the regular medications we use for diarrhea, constipation, some of the dietary things we do, some of the things about movements that help all of us in terms of being able to be regular. All of those things are still uh, uh, something that we do here, but we're having a little more issues and a little more in terms of the swallowing issues. Um, I'm not going to focus on this too terribly much, except to say that um, as individuals are having increasing problems in terms of mobility and still wanting to be very independent, uh, we see the broken bones. And I bring up the safety issue because we're continuing to see that as people have a setback with a broken something, it just is a setback. And so that rehabilitation in terms of getting back to normal sometimes isn't always back to 100% of normal. So as much as we can, we want to do things in terms of safety around the home, safety safety at schools, whether it's a shadow and aid, other things with handrails uh, in terms of, again, distinguishing uh, with colors, because again, the color vision is getting decreased over time. Uh, lots of things we need to do to try and make the home safe. And this may be something as a community, we even want to think about getting some coaching and helping on to be able to help each other. Uh, sleep is an issue. Uh, sleep, I think, is an issue in part because of sometimes individuals are having seizures or electrical activity at night that's interrupting sleep, as well as just other individuals, I think, are having not overt seizures, but differences in brain waves that we're seeing at night. Um, the reason, one reason this is important is that during the night is when you're doing a lot of your consolidation of learning and memories and making those into long-term memories from what you've experienced during the day. And so some of the things that we're seeing in terms of learning problems, learning disabilities, memory problems, those types of things, they're compounded if we're having trouble with sleep at night. And so there are things that we've been thinking about. Um, I won't bore you with a lot of the details, but things that, that we've been thinking about of even monitoring at home, sleep during the night to see whether that's something we can see if we're seeing a change. And we're trying out some electronic gadgets to be able to do that and to do that so that in your convenience, you wouldn't have to go to a sleep center to do this, but ways that we could be able to see how that's going and see if we can improve things. So stay tuned for more things to come. Um, within this, uh, and I, again, all of you know this, I think, um, different people are having different behavioral things. Uh, some people are having trouble staying on task, uh, problems with attention. Sometimes this can get treated with a para or a shadow in terms of a school-based setting, sometimes in terms of medication to help, sometimes in terms of just taking a break. Um, but between that, anxiety, and some people autism, and some people... Um, Sometimes uh, self-injurious behavior, sometimes repetitive behaviors, we can see all of those things. But in general, in a good way, our children, our individuals, and our families are wonderful. Uh, and I just want to emphasize um, amazing, amazing, wonderful, loving people. 
Um, this is now where we get to be very data dense. And if some of you want to close your eyes and just listen to me, that's perfectly okay. Um, but within all of these, we're starting to use very standardized measures that are acceptable to people like the FDA, the EMA, uh, individuals that think about uh, how to be able to prove to them that something is effective. And we've been doing this very intentionally in the koala study, as well as what we can doing online. We've been trying to think about measures that are going to be acceptable because we're marching forward in terms of clinical trial readiness and eventually being able to get things approved for us for treatments. So as we're doing this, these are all what we call standardized measures. And in many cases, I've chosen these because the agencies have agreed that this is something they'd accept. And so we want to know our baseline. We want to know what we are now so that we can know in the future, are we bending the curve by making things get better? Or if the natural history is that things are getting worse over time, we need to know how what the slope of that curve is, because if we can even just stabilize things, make them stay the same, that's a significant improvement. And that's something that the agency and scientists uh, would say is we're successful, we're, we're doing something that's good. So one of these we call the Vineland. Um, you can think about it as being a measure of function in day-to-day -day life. How are individuals able to do the normal tasks of daily living? I won't go through all of these, but we break these into different skills that we have in daily life, and we call these violin plots. So this is giving us an idea of the distribution of everyone in the community that's done this and realizing that there's a lot of variability because we have people who are different ages and we have people with different types of genetic variants. So you know how we measure this. In the average population, an average person would have a score of 100. And so you can see within this, most of the people in our community are below the average of a, a mean of 100 in the general population. For those of you who think about this, the way this particular measure works is that it has a standard deviation of 15, and it's a normal distribution. And I don't expect most people to worry about this. And so again, you can close your eyes and zone out uh, if you're not interested. But that means that in a normal population, we'd have people that have a range of 70 to 130, and we would consider that to be normal. So we've drawn a line here at the range of 70 to show you that there are some people that are still in the normal range of the population. They're above 70, mostly above uh, about 110 to 70 within that. But we also have people that clearly are below that in terms of where they are. I would say in general, the way I read this is we're affected in many similar domains. Mobility, uh, not surprisingly, is a domain that we have a lot of problems with, um, but issues in terms of just daily living, because in part mobility affects daily living as we're seeing that. Um, so this is a freeze in terms of where we have, and the lower the score is, the more impaired a person is. And so we have some people that are pretty impaired. Uh, other people, I would say in a good way, are, are actually uh, very functional in terms of this. Um, Importantly, we've been looking at this over time. So we have some people who have done two and now some people who have done three different time points for this. So we can see how things are changing over time. And importantly, we are seeing that things are changing and in general, they're going down. Now this is interesting, but I will also say really, really difficult for us as a field because our children, when we think about this, children normally are gaining skills over time, right? Normally children are developing. So they're gaining skills, they're going up. And so we've got that on top of normal childhood development where people are gaining skills with at the same time because of canned individuals who are losing some skills. And so some individuals have these two conflated where they're gaining skills because they're developing as a child, but they're relative to their peers losing skills. And so the real complexity in this, which I don't expect most of you to worry about, is that we have a couple different things going on as we're analyzing the data and as we're trying to estimate what's going to happen when we start a treatment. We're trying to think about as a child, what would I project is normal development for a child at that age over time? How do we superimpose what CAND is doing and how do we superimpose what CAND is doing by the individual type of genetic variant that we have? And so the reason that I'm emphasizing the complexity is that when we eventually have to prove to someone that a treatment is working, the numbers really matter. So I'm going to say it again. It's important for everyone to get all in because you're helping not only yourself, you're helping everyone in the community. And even though we've got 177 people right now, I'll tell you that what we really need is we need over a thousand people with probably five different data points a year apart. 
that's eventually where we're going to need to get to. I know we can do it, but I want to put the numbers out there in terms of goals for the community, because I think by the time we get to ultimately, which is going to be treatment for everyone, we're going to need to be all in to do that. As we're doing this, we are, as I said, seeing that we're losing a little bit over time. We're getting a better sense now of what our slope is, how much we're losing, what that rate is, if there are particular ages or times where it's going to be more important. But I can tell you right now, we're at the very earliest stages of understanding that because we have individuals who are across the age range, across the variant, across the world, and there are differences around the world. And I'm just going to say this once, COVID has made this more complicated to understand what's happened as we've been restricted from our normal routine, uh, everyday life, and, and then what's changed. Within this, uh, we've had a little over 30 individuals, um, and this was before this week, who did the koala study at Columbia. And then we've had another approximately 30 people who have been here. And uh, we had um, folks here uh, who are the same folks, except for the eye exam, the same folks that we've had doing the koala study at Columbia. We brought all the equipment, all the people to do everything to be here to take advantage of the fact that you were here. So the numbers should double. I do not have the data from Thursday and Friday yet. That was a little too much to ask uh, for the team, but we'll get that together as quickly as we can. Um, in terms of looking at the group, this is the distribution of how the group in Koala at Columbia was looking. And I put these little uh, infographics at the bottom so you could see by mobility level how folks were doing. Uh, we have a distribution of some people that are relatively independent in mobility, some people who are completely wheelchair bound at this point. So it's a good representation is the point that I want to make in terms of our entire community. Um, as we're doing this, and I don't really care about the specific uh, sort of what this means from an intuitive point of view, but I do just want to show you again that we've been doing things that the FDA EMA would think about in terms of standardized measures. Um, and as we're doing that, we're seeing a distribution. Um, so we realize that there is in a good way, um, it's good to see that we have a range in terms of doing that. It does make it a little harder to come up with things that'll be one size fits all for everyone um, as we're thinking about this. And and so as we're doing this, we are likely going to need to tailor by the individual ability level, some children who can walk, some children who can't walk, um, some children who can talk, some who can't talk. And so it's likely we're going to have to tailor things as we go through this. Um, we've been doing things in terms of what we call fine motor skills as well. Um, so for the individuals who are able to do this, and some of you may remember that challenge of being able to put those pegs in that pegboard and get it just right. And it's frustrating, I know. Um, but in doing so, uh, very, very helpful to be able to see where people are. Again, the measure for this is 100 is normal. And so you can see there's some people that are actually functioning okay in terms of being above normal, uh, but the majority of our folks at the lower age range in terms of doing that. And then we've had a measure as well in terms of thinking about thinking, um, thinking about thinking. So how you do in terms of all of those. And for those of you who met with Dr. Fee uh, or Fa, those were the types of measures that we were doing. So again, um, and for anyone who's interested in particular in terms of knowing about their own child, if I haven't talked to you, uh, if anyone from our team hasn't talked to you, we're glad to talk to you about those results. Okay, let me stop there and just pause for questions, and then I'm going to give you a preview to what we're going to talk about this afternoon. But let me pause here for a second and see if we've got any questions. Do we have anybody? Can you hear me? Do we have anybody in the room that would like to ask a question? You can raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. We had one question online. Oh, was somebody? Yeah. Here. I should probably know this, but um, what's the, the quick description of the difference between the natural history study and koala? Janie's doing both, but I'm, it's just data. Yeah. Okay, so with this, um, what I'll describe is they're, they're both, in a way, a natural history study, right? So it's a good question. It's confusing the terminology I've used. Let me distinguish them as the online study and the in-person study. How's that? Um, so the difference in the online version is that you're reporting information to us and we trust you on that. And, and I mean that sincerely, we do trust you on that. When it comes to other people, sometimes they give us a question about, well, you know, are, is a parent, is a caregiver accurate? Maybe, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. So the nice thing about Koala is it's 
an independent evaluator who's doing the same assessment. So you've seen our independent evaluators, right, in terms of doing that. So that gives a level of verification is the word I'm going to use, so that what we're hearing from caregivers, we have now have an independent verification to be able to say, yes, in fact, they very accurately reported this information. You should trust regulators, the information that we got from caregivers, because I can tell you independently, we saw the same thing. So we've very intentionally gone through that process with a subset of you who have been nice enough to do that, because now we can be able to say that we should be able to use all of the data that we're getting. Or if there's something where we're seeing a difference in terms of what's reported, we know what those discrepancies are and what we need to do in some other way in terms of the verification. So I'll give you an example of that. So I, I alluded to it earlier, but seizures are something that we're finding that at the end of the day, we're really going to need to be able to have an EEG to be able to differentiate some things that are brain dysfunction from true epilepsy or seizures. And when we look at it, myself included, when you look at a child in terms of how they're acting, it's sometimes very hard to tell unless you have the electrodes on the brain to be able to see those brain waves and to see the electrical activity going nutso with, an, with a seizure. And so now we realize, okay, that's one place where we need to be able to have some independent verification. So that's the, that's the thinking in terms of why we did that. Great. Thank you. Uh, the question is about, uh, you, you said we have now 177 individuals, and then you mentioned that uh, the FDA needs 1,000 individuals. To do what exactly, and what is the difference to the N of 1 study? Okay, so I'm going to talk about the N of 1 in just a second, and we're going to spend a lot of time this afternoon talking about the N of 1, so I'm not, I'm not not that I'm not hearing your question. Um, it is not that the FDA has had a meeting with me and said, Dr. Chung, we need a thousand people. I'm estimating based on what we're seeing so far in terms of the heterogeneity or the differences that we're seeing in the community and wanting to be able to see sensitivity to change and to be able to not have to wait five years to see that. And so based on the power calculations we've done to try and project this, my guess is based on that heterogeneity I showed you in terms of the different mutations that we're seeing, as well as the different ages of people we're seeing and how this is changing, that I think that's a good ballpark in terms of what we're going to need. Might I be wrong by 50 or something? Yeah, I might be wrong by 50 or so. Uh, but the point is that right now we're pretty far off from where we ultimately need to be to be able to know exactly what we should do and make sure we don't leave anyone behind in that. I'm not saying that we can't make progress until then, right? We're going to keep marching forward no matter what that number is. Um, but if we can get there faster, I think we're going to all be able to make a stronger argument for lots of reasons and for lots of, in, in lots of good ways. Yeah. Um, just picking, backing off of that question. So um, there are probably plenty of people out there with CAN that just haven't been diagnosed and we all know the difficulty of getting the testing done, fighting with insurance, with all these people that probably have the diagnosis too that could help us reach that 1,000 number. Is there anything that we could do to help that can be done to help these people get diagnosed? Yep. Okay, a couple of great points. Um, I'll spend just a little time talking about, so how do we get the undiagnosed diagnosed, right? That's the, the fundamental question. So I'm going to get to that in a second, but let me also say that the lower hanging fruit is those who are diagnosed, but yet aren't in the 177, right? So let's start with that in terms of, I think we could double those numbers within, by the end of the summer, really, if we wanted to. So that's the lowest hanging fruit. The second is the undiagnosed. And within the United States, I'll say that you guys have a very powerful, well, not just the United States, worldwide, you guys have a very powerful voice. So whether it comes to your, from an advocacy point of view, your state legislature. So for instance, I've now, even though I've only been in Massachusetts for a month, I've already testified in front of the state legislature in terms of getting genetic testing covered for Medicaid and uh, um, because of Medicaid, everything else. So whether it's at your state level, whether it's at the federal country level, access to genetic testing is the entry point, the on-ramp in terms of being able to do that. So that's number one. 
Um, within this, the reason I said things like this comes as a label of cerebral palsy, this comes as epilepsy, this comes as developmental delay, this comes as autism. So I've had a lot of position papers saying that every child, for instance, diagnosed with autism should get access to genetic testing, not just for this, but in general, they should get access to genetic testing. So the same drum beats that you have with your legislatures, again, access to genetic testing. I won't go into it in a lot of detail, but I very strongly believe in leaving no child behind. And when I say no child behind, I mean that every single child, I only control the United States, but every child, at least in the United States, will be able to get access to this. And I'll talk to anyone who's interested in it, but in a universal way where it just gets covered for every single child for every single genetic condition that we have a treatment for, because I don't want to leave anyone behind. So at the end of the day, give me 10 years, I'll take care of it. But in the meantime, we can't wait 10 years. So we've got to get all the folks who are symptomatic in. Yep. One second. Is it on? I don't know if it's on, but um, do you feel, because of a bigger, is it on? Oh, is it on? Oh, there we go. It's on. Um, do you feel that because of a, a larger population that we do have in the numbers are pre-puberty and younger, that the lean towards therapy is sort of going to be based more on that than our older children that are even just currently being diagnosed, but are still fully in the range of all those disabilities? So we're going to talk about this uh, throughout the weekend, um, but the answer is no. Um, it's important, number one, that we don't conceptually leave anyone behind, but in doing so, we're going to have to try, we're going to have to have a bundle of therapies based on the genetics. We'll get into that in just a second. So I, I do want to save a couple minutes for me to move on, uh, but it'll be primarily based on the genetic because I think the genetics will target the actual molecules we use on the treatment. So that's number one. Number two, in terms of the trial design, we have to see if I can, if we can move the needle with the treatment. And so we have to know what that is that we're measuring. Are we measuring seizures? Are we measuring EEGs? Are we measuring cognition? Whatever it is, that now becomes tailored to what the symptoms of that person are at that time in their life. And so that's why I emphasize we're trying to get life course information. We're trying to understand over the life course how that's changing. And we may have to tailor different types of outcome measures to see if we're making a difference based on groups. We can't totally tailor it for every single person. We're going to have to have sufficient numbers of people in a group to be able to bundle their data together to see in that group are we making a difference. So I do think it's going to be a different study design, if you will, for this group over here than for this group over here. And we're probably going to have to have have multiple trials that we're doing at the end of the day. Uh, so I have a question about the nerve optic atrophy, and I will be very specific. For example, for my daughter, Erika, she's six, and until uh, a few months ago, six months ago, her nerve optic was looking good. At the last uh, eye exam, uh, the ophthalmologist told us that the nerve optic is looking pale. So the question is, is there something that we can do to, I don't know, not to stop, to help? The simple answer is not yet. Okay. I'm going to emphasize yet. Okay. So we're going to get there but not yet. We don't have anything for the question in the optic nerve atrophy. What's your recommendation, Dr. Chang? What can I do to be able to slow that down or stop it? I don't have anything yet. Okay. Let me use this though, as the, because I see the look of angst and concern on people's faces. So let me now shift the conversation. I'll come back if I can. Um, let me shift the conversation to one of hope, because I do think we do have hope. We don't have an answer yet. We don't have everything worked out. But I can see I can see that light at the end of the tunnel. I can also see that we've got a half a dozen steps to be able to get to the end of the tunnel for everyone, but I can see the light coming through. So again, this is information that's been approved for the Rosen family for me to be able to share. Uh, and this afternoon, uh, Sally's actually going to be kind enough to share her personal experience. Uh, but these are the data that come from Susanna's N of one ASO treatment that we've been trying. So we've done this in collaboration with N. Lorem. In doing so, this ASO was used to be able to, uh, for, as I'll get into, not specifically Susanna's KIF1A mutation, but as I'll get to in a second, it does target a genetic variant that she has in KIF1A. That same variant 
I hope will be able to be in present in some people in this room and some people who are out there online. So I'll say it again later, we need you to get your blood drawn for your person with KIF-1A because I need to see if you want to be able to be part of something like this, whether or not the same ASO that was developed in this case is something that could be used for your child or your family member. And that is not available in your genetic test report. It is not available in all likelihood from the genetic information that was derived from your genetic test report. We need to derive that information. So I'll say it one last time, blood draw around the corner, anytime during the day today, but only today, we're not gonna have our phlebotomist here tomorrow. We wanna be able to get the blood samples to do this free of charge, doesn't cost you anything to, doesn't cost you anything to do, cost me a boatload to do. But as we're doing this, we wanna make sure that we can figure out who in that catalog could be used by this. Let me walk you through what this means. And I know this is an important one, so I'm gonna take some time to do it. D stands for day number. So this is going through, and I know it's teeny tiny. It's like everyone's squinting. So I'm sorry, it's so small, but just look at the trends. D is day number. So it's looking at day zero when we started this. Each time there's a red mark is the time that we gave an ASO. And after the ASO, we did a measurement of something to see what the effect was. So dosing, dosing, and we're going up in dose, 20 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 60 milligrams, 60 milligrams. So we go up in dose as we're doing it. Each one of the rows is a different thing that we're measuring. And we're measuring a lot of different things because going into this, we didn't know what was gonna change. I still, I have to say, learn things I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis about what's changing. The top one, and, and Sally and Luke will tell you about this, I torture them, really. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm kidding you them about this, but, but I really do ask them for a lot because as we're working, I didn't know what was gonna be changing. And so we all needed to be eyes wide open and looking very, very closely at everything. So I had them, even before they started, start to collect seizure, we call it seizure diary data. Every single day, Luke and Sally were talking to their Alexa and saying, Alexa, we've got a seizure. Alexa, that seizure lasted so long. So there's a recording that they then had to go and transcribe into this Excel spreadsheet that we've been keeping every single day how many seizures, how long the seizures lasted, how many falls, how bad the falls were, every single little bit of data we could collect so that we could see if we were making a difference. That dedication was ginormous because they really have been the pioneers in terms of going forward to see, was there anything here? In doing that and seeing the richness of that data, and I think I can share this, but Luke, you'll shoot me afterwards if not, taking videos for me to be able to be at the dinner table, for me to be able to be at school, for me to be able to be at birthday parties, to be able to see everything that Susanna was and was not doing, I could then with my own eyes, basically be a fly on the wall to be able to see the things were, that were changing. In some cases, things that were changing that I was not expecting to change. And so with that, I've been a very, very close observer in terms of what's going on and in a good way, that's why I said, I do think there's light at the end of the tunnel. Now, some of these things are not things, again, that in a good way, I wasn't expecting to change. And I'm excited about that because I do think there's some reversibility of things that I thought might have been lost forever. Some things that I think we actually have regained. So let me walk you through the slide. On the top, Luke and Sally were keeping track of the number of seizures. And although I know you can't see it at the beginning before we started the treatment, this was over 100 seizure episodes or what looked like seizure episodes per day. So you can see that cluster at the top. Bottom line is by the time we've got to the 60 milligram dose, that number of seizure epi like episodes has gone from over 100 a day to a very, very small number and in some cases zero, okay? We've had times We've had days where there have been other things that have happened and that number has gone up. So I won't say that this is like totally wiped out, but gotten much, much better as you can see over time. Luke and Sally have also measured the longest seizure in terms of looking and, and our assumption that things that were longer were more serious. And so you can see the, num the longest seizures going from uh, greater than 150 seconds all the way down to very, very brief things that we're seeing. So if we're seeing something, there are fewer of them and they seem to be briefer. So both of those good. 
number of falls. And, and I have to say, this is uh, one of the things that's most remarkable because at the beginning, Susanna was falling all the time. Broken bones, seriousness in terms of doing this. The amazing thing is that Susanna's numbers of falls have not only decreased, but her mobility, the amount that she's moving has increased. So what I mean by that is it's not as if she's sitting in a wheelchair and that's why she's not falling. If anything, she's actually much more ambitious in terms of trying to move around and do things, but yet even despite that, falling less. So in a good way, a lot more independence. And from a quality of life point of view, I think that's a huge in terms of her just being able to be independent and move. Now, interestingly enough, and this is interesting because again, some of these are unexpected, we've been doing this six minute walk test. And for those of you who are out here doing this, we put you through the same thing to see how your kids were doing. And within this, Susanna's six minute walk test hasn't changed that much. That is, we measure how many meters she can go in six minutes. That hasn't changed very much. But yet when we look at the videotape for her and look at the kinematics of how she's moving, where she's bearing her weight, what the smoothness of her moving, that we can see a difference in. And so we're going to have to get smarter than the FDA usually is in terms of just using a measure of how many meters in six minutes. We're going to have to develop in part through AI and machine learning, but other ways of actually looking at coordination of movement and quantifying that. So don't worry, we've got, we're gonna be working on that. In addition to this, and this is to me the ultimate measure is quality of life. And this is the bottom one. And I know again, these numbers are small, but the, the point is, is that higher numbers are better. And that overall, as Luke and Sally have thought about the quality of life, it's gone from here and it's come up dramatically to there. And I'll let Sally tell you this afternoon all the details of how they think that's changed. But overall, I think this is positive news. Now, is this perfect news? We're gonna talk about it this afternoon, but there's still big gaps. Still big gaps in terms of we're not getting to the eye, still big gaps in terms of this doesn't last forever, still big gaps in terms of what we have to do to go through this, it's not easy. And in doing this, um, it's not cheap either. So we're gonna have to think about how to be able to deal with these. On the other hand, I can tell you, cause I work with a lot of different groups, I don't have data like this for any of my other groups yet. So in a good way, there really is hope, and we really do have, I think, opportunities for momentum. So we'll talk a lot more about this later. I'm going to end uh, because a lot of people have asked me or uh, asked the members of the team. They said, so Dr. Chung, what does this mean? You've deserted us. You've left New York. You've left Columbia. Like, what's going to happen in this next phase? So let me explain in terms of the movement to Boston Children's. And for those of you who don't live in the United States, this may give you a little more background. So I've now become uh, what we call the chair of pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital. So for me, this means I'm not just in charge of genetics, which is what I was in charge of at Columbia. I'm now in charge of children's health, basically, at what some would argue is, if not the best children's hospital in the country, at least one of the best children's hospitals in the United States. Within this, I have done this very intentionally. So this was not just, I thought, eh. I don't know, we'll pack our bags, we'll go 200 miles north. This was done very intentionally and strategically, knowing that at this time in history, our opportunity to be able to move forward for rare diseases, we now have an inflection point. I truly, in my heart of hearts, believe that and intentionally made the move exactly at this moment where we can have liftoff. What we have at Children's, and I'm not just saying this to brag, what we have at Children's is amazing depth of our bench. So we have within the people who report up to me, 700 doctors who are incredibly talented in terms of all different dimensions of children's health. We have equipment like you've never seen. We've got a brand new seven floor building that is just dedicated to individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders and their needs. Believe it or not, I have a dental unit in our building, which is specifically for individuals with disabilities. That building was completely designed with families in terms of designing everything from the layouts of the pictures to our EEGs, our MRIs, everything we've got is one-stop shop within one building. The parking is fabulous. Everything is fabulous. So within this, we have designed everything so that we can have what I think of as care until the cure. And so as you, for any of you who want to be able to get their care, your care at Children's, We'll be able to have your care, that care, we will save that information with your permission to be able to populate what we're doing for the clinical trial readiness and get to the cures. And we have all the facilities for any treatment that we might need for any clinical trials. 
anything that I need from neurosurgeons, anything that I need from hospital beds, anything that I need from the research pharmacy, from regulatory, we've got everything all under one roof. So this was done incredibly intentionally for you so that we are ready as a community to be able to make the next step and to make the next move forward. As we're doing this, uh, if there's anyone who saw me as a patient, not just as a research study, but as a patient at Columbia, the one thing I will say is that if you want me to continue as your personal doctor, I need you to actually move your medical records from Columbia to Boston Children's. I do not have access to your medical records at Columbia. Columbia does. And so if you want to see another doctor at Columbia, you certainly can. And all of the information is there, but we will need you to sign a medical release so that I can know everything that we were doing for you at Columbia and take that up to Children's with us. The other reason for the move is not just what's at Children's. And this is going to sound a little sort of maybe hard to understand, but the environment across Boston is incredibly rich because now I'm at Harvard Medical School. I have all of our Harvard affiliated hospitals. I have the Broad, which is an incredible genomics resource. And I have what we have in Kendall Square and in Cambridge in terms of biotech pharma. And so right now we have, again, sort of everything right around our corner within about a five mile radius for all the things we need going forward. So I've done my part. I need you to do your part. We need to together be able to march forward and take advantage of this opportunity, and I do think we are prepared to be able to do that. So I'm going to give you just a preview of what we're going to talk about this afternoon in case anyone wants to catch me at lunch or any other time. What I talked about before for Susanna is about uh, oligonucleotides, and we're going to talk more about that. I want to focus the last bullet. The good and the bad of the strategy that we've talked about is I think about it as a bridge, but it is not permanent. That's good and that's bad. It's good that it's not permanent so that if anything goes wrong, it washes out of the system. It's not a forever sort of thing that happens. The bad is it's not a permanent, it's not a forever thing. We have to keep reapplying it as we do this. And so I do wanna to get to the point where we can think about something better. As we're doing this, for any of you that are really sort of interested in the science, uh, what we're doing is using that ASO to basically gobble up one copy of the KIF1A gene just the copy that's got the problem. So that's fundamentally what we're trying to do. We're trying to get rid of the one that's got a problem. And as we're doing this, I wanna introduce this idea of the, I call it handle. Some people call it a hook, but it's the way that we grab on and we figure out the difference between those two copies of the gene. We can't get rid of KIF1A altogether. If we get rid of KIF1A altogether, that's bad news. So we've gotta be very careful and very selective. So here's the trick, and this gets to be a little bit complicated. I've shown on the right with that star, the actual mutation. So that's when any of you look at your genetic test report and you'll say that I've got KIF1A and it talks about the exact position. It talks about exactly what the change is. That's what you and I are used to thinking about all the time. The problem is if you think back to that picture of the dots, we've got so many of those. If we had to develop even an ASO for every single one of those dots, we'd have to have a library that would have over 50 of those different things, the 50 of the ASOs. That would be a lot. So is there something we can do to help each other out? And here's the idea of the handle. All of us have other genetic variants in the KIF1A gene, all of us, every single one of us in the room, even if we don't have CAND. And that's because there's a lot of variation. One in a thousand positions is different between you and me. So we're using the fact that there are a lot of normal variations in the gene to be able to grab onto that. And rather than having to make 50 or 100 different ASOs, maybe we can get down to something like 10. And maybe there's enough variation amongst us, normal variation, that we can use to grab onto that handle and to be able to use that to differentially shut down the one copy of the KIF1A that we need to. To be able to understand who needs what ASO, we have to do a catalog now of these normal genetic variants and the mutation and we have to know that they're on the same strand of DNA. I have to be able to differentiate between the two of them. And so we have to use a method that we're, we call long read sequencing. So I know this isn't something that most of you are worried about, but other than this was not what was done when you had your genetic testing, when your child had your genetic testing, we have to do a new type of analysis. We have to look for a new type of genetic variation. This was not done before, and we need to do it now and we really need to do it now. 
Now, if you don't want to be part of that, perfectly fine. No one is forcing anyone to do it. But if you do want to be ready for the next wave of treatments, at least for the ASO wave of treatments that's coming forward, that's why we need to get your blood sample. So in doing this, as I said, I don't know yet because we haven't done the experiment for all of you how many of these handles we're going to need, but it's not just going to be one. It's not just going to be two. It's probably going to be, hmm, I don't know if it's going to be 10 or 20, but somewhere in that neighborhood is what I'm getting. I will say, and I'll say this to be completely transparent, if you are not of European ancestry, it is even more important for you to give your blood sample because what I know about genetic variation in regular populations is mostly based on what I know from individuals of European ancestry. So if you're like me and you have some of your ancestors that are not entirely European, you really, really want to participate because you run a higher risk of being left behind. Again, I'm not forcing anyone to do this. I'm just giving you the tips in terms of uh, what your partner, what the person next door can do for you and what they can't do for you. Okay. Uh, let me just wrap up by saying that there are a lot of people that go into all the work that we've been talking about today and what we'll be talking about throughout the weekend. Uh, most importantly, and this is one of my favorite pictures, it's in the wall of my, my new office, uh, is from our last meeting that we had. And uh, anyway, I'll look forward to having many more pictures in the future. So let me pause here and take questions on the second part. Dr. Chong, um, you just a... Uh, Okay, just a uh, couple, hopefully short questions. Uh, so the first is, um, my daughter's nine, I have a son that's 12. And um, when you talk about very extreme, uh, he's a A plus student and my daughter sort of struggles, if you will, at school. Do me um, a favor, just keep right, my, right, right. there you yeah. go. She, she sort of struggles at school, even with, just going through the eight, nine, time, ten timetables, so it's a it's always um, a constant reminder, and have her write it down and and try to remember that stuff. So, e, um, it, I mean, is that normal? Is that expected? Um, my my other question, um, you were talking about um, the blood work that it's recommended to do given the situation if if we do um decide to do that today i i know we only have today what are the uh next steps following that yep okay i just want to make sure the first before you give away the mic oh. the 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 issue is with what i just missed the symptom that she was having Rem was it remembering or yes okay yes um so I do think it's a common thing. Um, either, and some people are having trouble with focus, they get distracted, and as they get distracted, things just don't sort of really get drilled in. Other people, um, repetition is necessary. So to be able to learn something, it's as if they forget, it doesn't sort of stick, and, and to be able to uh, really form that memory. It's in part, I think, because of global brain dysfunction is the easiest way to say it. I just don't think the, the cells are as healthy as they need to be to be able to function in, in all dimensions. And then compounded on that, I think, are some of the sleep issues. But I think it's it's a symptom in terms of the brain just not being healthy is the easiest way to think about it. I do think that Conversely, as we look at how we can see if the brain is getting healthier, we may be able to look at some of these measures in terms of how quickly things are learned, how they stick, whether or not. So it's some of those things that we're looking at as, as Dr. Fee and others are doing those assessments. So that's the first part. Um, the second part in terms of the blood. So let me go through a couple logistics on things. Um, so with this, we've got a whole team of folks over here right around the corner to draw the bloods. It's several tubes of blood uh, because we're getting enough to be able to have, I'm doubling down to have two labs able to do this so that we don't lose any opportunities. We're also uh, keeping or we're measuring what we call biomarkers or being able to look at brain health through something in the blood to see if that's something that'll help us in terms of the clinical trial. So we're using this to do a couple different 
different things at one time. Uh, the most important is the person with CAND in your family to get the blood sample. So if there's uh, only one person in your family that does it, they're the most important. We are asking if parents are available to do it. We're using you as controls. Um, so to the extent that you're willing to do it, as we look at things like these biomarkers or other things, uh, you're a great comparator. Um, if you're squeamish and don't want to give blood for whatever reason, that's okay. But the most important person is the person with CAND. Um, as we're doing this and giving information back, I, I will tell you that it's probably going to take us somewhere between two or three months to be able to process everything and get all this information back. So don't call us on Monday morning asking what the results are. We won't have them yet. Uh, but as soon as we do, the most important thing I know that people are going to be asking is, uh, for the ASO that's been developed so far, is that going to work for my family member, right? And so I'm, that's what I'm guessing you're going to be asking about. So we'll try and get that information out as quickly as we can. All I'll also say um, that we realized coming into this that not everyone was going to be in the room here today. Not everyone was going to be in New York for this meeting. Uh, so I don't have them ready to ship out Monday morning, uh, but we will make sure that for those of you who aren't here with us present today, but who want to be included, that we can send out packets for you to do this. I'll tell you that this is easier for us to do in the first wave in the United States, just because of things that happen with international shipping and customs. And so it's likely that we're going to do the first wave of shipping packages out uh, through the U.S. We'll probably do that simultaneously, do a pilot, if you will, with some of our European colleagues to make sure we've got the best way of getting through customs. I don't know how I'm going to do that exactly, but anyway, getting them through customs. And then once we get know that we've got that working out, we'll bring everyone around the world in. But but I don't want everyone to have work really hard to get their blood drawn and then have it get stuck someplace. So, but we're not leaving anyone behind as we do it. Um, we will post with the help of the org, uh, be able to post instructions on how you can send us a message if you're interested and not in the room of getting one of those kits uh, and who you want to get it for and, and how to be uh, sign the paperwork to be able to do that. I hope that answered the question. Um, I believe that we are we're a little bit crunched on time, oh, and so uh, no, it's no problem at all. This is important stuff, and and Dr. Chung will be around today for more conversations. If you are, oh, uh, yes. In the koala study, do we already have the blood work, or is this blood sample separate from koala? As an insurance policy, I'm going to ask you to give another blood sample. Excellent. Um, for those of you who have questions online, thank you very much. Please note that we have taken those questions down and we'll be addressing them and uh, clarifying with Dr. Chung if need be. Um,